Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, the digital scholarship program here at Bryn Mawr. Um, which uh, I'll talk about it sort of a little bit generally, and then more specifically, I really want to talk about the student programs that we, we um, are working with. So our focus is really on faculty, staff, and student uh, research, and that we have both graduate and undergraduate students here at Bryn Mawr. Um, but we think of research as sort of a flexible category, so it includes things like um, digital exhibitions, which we've been doing in collaboration with our special collections and with our museum studies program, um, and some other sort of uh, extracurricular kind of things that the students work on that involves research um, but may not be for a grade for a class um, and we also provide many uh, professional development opportunities workshops communities of learning one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations things like that that you would kind of sort of expect from a program like this but again this talk is really going to focus on the student programming aspect of, of what we do and I want to talk a little bit about blended learning not necessarily at the course level or the assignment level which I think is where we often talk about it but at the programmatic level so this is sort of a, a thought experiment a little bit so you'll have to sort of help me with um, with some of this I think at the end and sort of where where to take this next um, so there are three programs student programs that I'll be talking about today um, and the ways that we've sort of implemented blended learning strategies in them. So I'm going to talk about our digital scholarship research assistance, which is during the academic year, our digital scholarship graduate assistance, and our digital scholarship summer fellows, which unsurprisingly uh, is in the summer. Um, and each of these is based on a cohort model. We actually think that's really important. Or I believe uh, very I've had very powerful experiences with cohorts uh, in my past, and so it's something that um, I've tried to implement in all of the programs that we that we sort of deliver um, and there's generally four to six students in each of these cohorts and they really um, have a lot of flexibility in sort of setting paths for learning for themselves so there's some direction um, uh, depending on which cohort we're talking about there might be more or less uh, but they do have a lot of agency over their their own learning so the first I wanted to talk about is our digital scholarship research assistance uh, I should say our first cohort was spring 2017, so we're just coming up on uh, like a one year anniversary of that wrapping up. Um, so a lot of this is, is new, but I think we've had a lot of successes sort of straight away. Um, so this is where we had four students from a variety of majors. So we have political science and econ, and some of them are double majors because Bryn Mawr students are like super ambitious about majors, which I imagine your students probably are too. Um, so I, whenever I list majors, there will be more majors than students. Um, <laughs> so political science and economics, Italian, anthropology, cities, and anthropology and biology as well here. Um, so we really have a, a wide range, and that's true of all of our cohorts. They, uh, the sort of mix of the disciplines is really important. Um, and they work for five hours a week for us during the academic year, and two of those hours are a required weekly meeting where we all meet together, but the other three are um, on their own time. Um, with this particular program, they had a guided sort of training. Um, so we had a lot of online materials. We use lynda.com a lot, which I imagine um, some of you who have that resource at your institutions um, use that, but also some free code, um, code academy and those kinds of um, things as well. Um, and they had some set activities that they did sort of on their own uh, as well. And so they did a lot, designed a collaborative project uh, and they wrote an internal seed grant for it, which we had sort of the opportunity to do here, um, which I thought was actually a lot of fun to sort of work with undergraduates on some grant writing that had sort of low stakes for them. Um, and then they implemented that project, and they did this in uh, less than two and a half months, which was kind of insane. Uh, but they did, uh, for May Day, which is a sort of major tradition here at Bryn Mawr, um, they took uh, uh, a Bryn Mawr lantern, which you can kind of see a little bit in that one picture there, which is another sort of important part of Bryn Mawr traditions. Um, and uh, each class has a color every year, and it's really important. Um, and so they actually wrote some programming, some scripts, to uh, work with Twitter's API so that on May Day, uh, if someone tweeted their class's hashtag, that lantern would light up in their class's color. Um, and it also on the screen behind that you can't see, it would display the tweets that were happening so you could sort of see in real time what was happening. So they designed this whole thing. They sort of uh, had the idea for it. They had the idea of like who was going to be actually using this. Um, and you can see sort of, again, uh, that's it in practice there. So this particular group was also um, one of the early sort of pilots for our digital competencies initiative that we have here at Bryn Mawr. Um, and so through the process, the students really gained many digital competencies. <laughs> so um, from project management to digital communication skills to a little bit of programming. 
Um, and so, so they had an opportunity to sort of test that out. But one of the major sort of um, aspects of that initiative is really helping students to reflect on the competencies that they're gaining. So not think of it, thinking of it as completion, but rather sort of how can they frame what they're doing in context for um, uh, employers and, and uh, folks sort of beyond Bryn Mawr to understand what they're doing. Um, and so we had a lot of opportunities to do that with this particular group. I remember one of the kind of um, uh, things that just happened was uh, the students a couple weeks in said, I don't know how to talk about what I'm doing here. I don't know how to talk about this digital scholarship stuff that mm -hmm. we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we pulled up actually one of their LinkedIn pages and we said, I, I just said, okay, let's do it. Let's talk about this. So we sort of reframed um, what they had been learning in the context of something that would work on LinkedIn. And they um, have reported that that was really useful for them, but that wasn't necessarily something that was, was planned. But I think again, bringing um, sort of what they learned in digital spaces uh, to a different kind of digital audience was actually important there. So over the same semester, I also worked with a group of graduate students, and we had five here, and this is from, from archeology, span history of art, and classics, and everything from a first year master's student to um, two students who are ABD and who actually just graduated, which was fabulous. Um, and they had, uh, similarly, they had five hours a week uh, and a two-hour two weekly meeting that we uh, had as well. Um, and But with this group, they had a lot more flexibility in terms of deciding what they wanted to study. And the idea was that each of those students was going to have an area of expertise that they were going to develop over the course of the semester. So I worked with them to sort of identify the tutorials that fit their interests and learning styles best. Um, and then they were responsible for sort of getting a handle on that content and then bringing it back and teaching this group later. So they, they brought what they had learned sort of in the online space back into the sort of in-person in um, sessions that they had. Uh, and then their learning was further reinforced by a collaborative project that they designed and implemented um, that really intentionally relied on the skills that they had been developing, in this case specifically um, data management and cleaning, um, web design, um, and sort of data visualization as well. And so they had um, designed a project that's related to um, uh, books checked out to carols in one of our libraries where the graduate students all have carols. And so, um, oh my goodness, five minutes, all right. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, yeah, so they sort of did an interactive visualization of the interdisciplinarity of their graduate programs, which I thought was sort of exciting. Um, but then what was really important here is they used what they learned to create online modules for a digital scholarship summer fellows for the undergrads over the summer. And so um, they sort of put what they had learned into those online modules and materials as well. Um, so the cycle was they learned digitally, they practiced what they learned in this collaborative sort of supportive space, they taught it in person, uh, and then they developed online learning modules for the undergraduates. So I'm going to skip forward a little bit here. Um, so our summer fellows sort of took advantage of that, and they were here 30 to 40 hours a week, so it was much more full term. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that program in the, the Q&A. Um, they also built an interactive um, data visualization that was based on things that they had learned from those modules um, over the semester. So um, the second year now, we've shifted our funding a little bit to be uh, directed towards a project that is directed by our clear postdoctoral fellow, Jessica Linker, um, who's here at the conference today. Um, and, but the blended learning model still remains where instruction happens both in person and in those online spaces as well. Um, and the students here are preparing, uh, this is a multi-year project, and so the students are preparing documentation for students to come after them, right? So the idea is um, that they're thinking about the future of this project, part of which they may not have, um, they might, may, once they graduate, they won't be involved with it anymore. So they're sort of thinking forward um, in that way. So, um, and they're building an interactive um, 3D space of actually a room here, 300, Dalton 300. If you're in this space, you might actually recognize this. Um, and they're doing a reconstruction of a 19th century when it was a chemistry lab um, for women uh, learning science here at Bryn Mawr, which is really exciting. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the drawbacks, I think, to employing uh, this blended learning at a program level. And one of the things has been, uh, the challenges has been that engagement over time is difficult. So, um, and it often feels sort of unidirectional. So the summer fellows learning from the graduate students modules sort of benefited from the graduate students work, but the graduate students didn't necessarily uh, see what was happening, right, with the, the undergraduates. And so um, they had actually reported to me that they wanted more opportunities 
to work in person with the undergraduates, right? So, um, I, and sort of witness the learning, I think is a big part of, of what they were hoping to sort of see. And I think this is an important point because sort of as a program director, I'm able to see the effects and the impacts that this has right across these different programs. Um, but the constituents of the programs might not and, and, and have not, right, in some ways. And I think that's sort of a missed learning opportunity, something that I want to keep thinking uh, about. So um, yeah, and so the, uh, oops, excuse me, I have lost my last page, there we go. Um, so sort of in thinking forward, I want to think about um, what might a blended learning approach to programming building look like? So I don't mean this in terms of implementing blended learning strategies sort of in individual, within individual programs, but maybe thinking about how blended learning approaches to programming building might be opened up to students and student learners who are maybe interested in, in thinking professionally about um, programs, right? Um, and you know some of the age-old sort of issues, uh, discoverability of these materials that they are created, I think, has been a challenge. And so part of what we're trying to do is make those materials more open. Um, so some of them are up. Some of the modules are actually up on GitHub now. But I want it to sort of create a more um, a better space for that to to happen um, and for people to be able to share it. Um, and I also sort of I take license often with like blended learning because I think about it also not in terms only of the online and the sort of in person, but also the varied levels of experience um, that people are bringing to the classroom and also the emphasis on sort of the individual and the collaborative learning, right, that's, that's happening, that's getting blended um, in that learning moment. Um, and so uh, like each summer we've had a student from the academic year who continues into the summer program and we've built in opportunities um, for that student to, uh, it, it, we've intentionally sort of done building, or sorry, intentionally built learning opportunities um, for those students to benefit from the differences. So like they've, we've made things that are more challenging, right? So we've uh, allowed for self-paced activities that have set the more experienced students um, more advanced assignments and things like that. But I think we can do better. I think we can do better about sort of um, intentionally building in the um, experiences of students, not as something separate, but as something that is more integrated into how the rest of the group is actually learning. So that's it for me. Thank you.